worms. Gross. But despite how gross they are, you'd be surprised how diverse this group really is. Even given us one of the biggest predators of a certain period in which life got really weird on planet Earth. Okay, so I know what we're all saying. Anomalocaris has the top spot as apex predator in the Cambrian, right? Well, the Cambrian was a long time. And whilst Anomalocaris was the biggest animal of the period, recent discovery shows us that it wasn't by much and that Anomalocaris was actually late to the apex predator party. In Perryland, Greenland, a team of paleontologists were exploring a locality known as the Sirius Passet back in 2023. Sirius Passet is an excellent example of what is known as a Lagerstadt, which is any locality that preserves organisms to an exceptional degree. Whilst this applies to any area of exceptional preservation, you most often hear the term used for Cambrian deposits. This was no different, and this Cambrian deposit yielded a find that was described at the start of 2024 as Timor Bestia Coprii, literally meaning scary beast. But let's face it, you can't exactly figure out what this thing really is from that vague name alone. So what actually was this? Timor Bestia, despite appearances, was actually a very basal Shetognath, or arrow worm. These are marine predatory worms that live throughout the open ocean, existing as planktonic creatures that use ambush predation on their fellow planktonic species, such as cladocarans, amphipods, krill, and fish larvae. Now the morphology of these guys vary, but they are generally, well, arrow-shaped, with long, thin bodies complete with lateral wing-like structures. When compared to these extinct creatures, however, Timor Bestia didn't quite match this description, instead having a wider, flatter body with two large antennae at its front, looking more like a soft-bodied version of Anomalocaris. Another major difference was its size, with this guy hitting 30 centimeters long. Now, this might not sound like a lot by today's standards, but remember, this guy lived in the early Cambrian, a time when life was yet to reach megafaunal levels. In fact, Timor Bestia predates Nomalocaris, meaning that not only was this the largest thing on the planet at the time, it's also the earliest example of an apex predator. This guy had another trick that set it apart from modern arrow worms, and that is the ability to swim. Propelling itself through the water column, it could prey upon small and abundant arthropods such as the very strange Isoxes, Chiosortoquia, and Paulo Terminus, chasing them down with those long lateral wings and using those strange antennae to sense for and possibly grab these small critters. And this also brings us to that freaky mouth. We know that these jaws were surprisingly complex for the time, i.e. there were at least two parts that came together through some sort of musculature with lateral structures coming together in this case that were supported by some sort of structure at the posterior and anterior parts of the mouth hole. But as to how exactly these came together and with what strength for this particular species, we're still not sure. Now, I will be honest, I really don't like doing a segment on an animal that is so short. But what we know about the earliest known apex predator is still limited considering it is a soft-bodied and distant animal that was only published last year. So here's to hoping much more comes out about the fear-inducing beast. Whilst we wait, why don't I answer today's questions? The first of which comes from Lucas Josephson Nudson. Hope I said that right. 8097, who has asked. I'd like to hear about the relationship between frogs and other tetrapods. Are they anapsids or have anapsids gone extinct? Ah, okay. So for those that don't know, all amniotes are separated based on how many openings they have in the skull, namely their temporal fenestra. Diapsids have two and are broadly equivalent to reptiles. Synapsids only have one and the only group left today is the mammals. And anapsids have no openings. Now, anapsids actually existing is considered dubious these days since the animals that we traditionally consider anapsids are giving us a little bit of trouble in terms of placing them phylogenetically. For example, turtles. And most think that they're actually from the other group and their temporal fenestrae have just closed up. Either way, if we're talking frogs, they wouldn't be considered anyway, since this temple opening system only applies to amniotes, not amphibians like frogs, since they still need to stay close to water and lay their eggs in it. So with regards to their relationship with other tetrapods, they're pretty distant. Amphibians are an incredibly ancient group since they were the first vertebrates to come onto land fully. 
They still kept their reliance on the water, however, whilst the amniotes eventually split from them somewhere around the Carboniferous period. Amphibians did incredibly well for a long time, with a hugely diverse variety in appearance and lifestyles. But once those amniotes came along and took over the land, given that they didn't have as much reliance on water, their growth was limited. Don't get me wrong, they're still doing pretty good, but their heyday is most definitely over. So yeah, even if anapsids have ever been a thing, they would be pretty distant in terms of their relationship with frogs. Our next one comes from Christian Newling, 3859, who's asked, I'd like to hear about dinosaurs found in Australia and New Zealand. And are there very noticeable differences between those dinosaurs and dinosaurs found outside of what is now the Australian continent? Especially as Australia has very unique wildlife compared to the rest of the world. Yes, it does indeed, which is something I've actually done a whole video on here. Now the reason that life is so weird there now is because of Australia's isolation from other continents. Meaning that life has done its own thing without homogenising with the rest of the animal kingdom. Same applies here to New Zealand. When it comes to dinosaurs, however, there aren't actually any notable differences between Australian dinosaurs and the rest of the world. Sure, they have their own species, but they don't really stand out like the weirdos that live there now. Reason for this is quite simple. Australia didn't break away and become isolated until the dinosaurs had already been dead for 30 million years. Before that, it was still attached to Antarctica, which had more life on it owing to the lack of ice caps. That, in turn, also hadn't long broken away from Africa and South America, so dinosaurs never really got the chance to get really strange here as they were still interacting with the rest of the world. Anyway guys, thank you so much for watching. Uh, this one's a little bit of a shorter one, but it does give me a chance to play a bit of catch up so you'll get the next one a little bit sooner than usual. If you're new here, please don't forget to like and subscribe if you've enjoyed this so that I can catch you guys next time. Winky face. <laughs>